decided, I'd, I don't know, maybe people will have seen uh, my sort of 15 minutes of fame on BBC Breakfast a, a few months ago. And um, it was talking about uh, bereavement and euthanasia in animals and things. And it, it made us really think that, obviously, we, we try and offer as the best service we can to people, but there's still a lot of people don't really understand what goes on. A lot of people don't prepare themselves for it, to be honest. And, and it's the sort of thing that... Um, it's almost too late when you realise that you need it and, and obviously you're, you're often not in the right frame of mind to be, to be thinking about the right questions to ask or, or what to listen to. So we thought it was a good idea to, to do this. Like I said earlier on, it's put a lot of people off. I know, you know people that have come to these talks on a regular basis and they've, they've decided that they didn't want to come actually to see it because of obviously the... Um, the subject matter and they didn't you know they were already upset and some people even had the horses euthanized a few years ago and, and didn't really want to think about it anymore but anyway we thought we thought we'd do it and uh, well we, I, I think enjoy it may not be the right word but I hope you find it quite useful um, now why is it not working there we go uh, yeah so that's me uh, we, we thought that sort of making the, that decision, in other words, to euthanize your horse, and, and it is something that we probably all will have to do at some point, and, and it, it's quite a, um, you know, it's one of those things where everyone wants the horse to die in the sleep or have a gallop around the field and drop dead, but it, it really doesn't happen. Well, very rarely it happens anyway. So we've always got to make that decision, and it is probably the hardest decision you're going to make um, as, as a horse owner, as an animal owner. And, um, and so hopefully we can, we can try and make that a little bit better. And, and certainly as, as a practice, we, uh, we will try and do our very best to help you with that and, and to try and make it a little bit easier. Um, and hopefully starting with this, and, and you know, if, if we can get you know, if Dave can take this and put it on our website, then other people can, can access that if they need to. So, um, I was just, I was really struck by the amount of, of training that, that vets get. Uh, you know, again, anyone that, that watched the thing on, on BBC will realise, uh, and I'm not going to talk about that all night, I promise. Um, but they will realise, really as vets, we don't get that much training on euthanasia or, or bereavement or how to cope with people or how to really counsel people, which I think is, is an important thing because it is, it is the loss of a, a loved one. At the end of the day, you know, I, um, I, I sort of equated it to like the loss of my mum and, and it, it, it really is like that. You know, you, you still have the same emotions and, and you know, this, this is my, uh, well, the, the qualification I did and this is the only euthanasia bereavement training that we got and this is one you know, small section. This is a the A um, A module of a um, of a well, the equivalent of a master's degree. My my orthopedic certificate, um, so orthopedic surgery certificate, and so it, it's a tiny, tiny amount of that. And and the vets nowadays get very much the same, or they might do a little bit of role playing with an actor where they're trying to console somebody. But it really is a, a badly dumb thing I think in the veterinary world and um, although there are various other support things like we'll come to talk about um, really as you know we're, we're in the front line and we're relying on our I, I think our uh, self or our, our compassion our internal compassion to try and get you through it so we will try and do that as much as we can but it, it's still very hard and I think you know like I said we're not we're not psychiatrists we're not psychologists we're not counsellors but we will do our best and and really do what we think is is the right thing so so really when you're talking about euthanasia there's there's two types really and and it, it does make a a big difference to how you cope with it and um and how you as an owner can deal with it. So the first one is elective. So that's when you make the decision. You actually decide, the time's come, <clears throat> I'm going to euthanize my horse. Um, and then there's an emergency one where you really don't have that option. It, it, we're talking about broken legs, we're talking about surgical colics, we're talking about a horse that won't get up in the field, that, that type of thing. Um, and the, the emotions with those two are very, very different. And um, we'll come on to, to chat about that. So elective... Um, this this is a photograph of an old horse. Um, he had the he had well you can see his, his left knee there is huge. It's um, it's very arthritic. He was knuckling over at the knee. He couldn't stand. He actually bent 
sideways rather than forward and backwards. So we got to the point with his horse, he was 28, something like that, and he had a good life, and, you know, um, but the decision had to be made. He was actually otherwise in good health. He was eating well, he was, you know, his coat was a good condition. Um, so, you, you know, that, that is a hard decision to make. You have got to make that decision and you've got to effectively, I suppose, you know, kill your horse is, is what we're talking about or, or make the decision to do that, um, which, like I say, is, is a very hard thing to do. Things like arthritis, tumours, Cushing's, even younger horses sometimes with laminitis, we have to make that decision, but you make that decision at, at the time. And, and it is the hardest to make. Um, one of the things about it is you generally have time to get your your head round it, so you you know you, you prepare yourself for it, and that is a that is an important part. Um, but there is a lot of guilt associated with that because, like I said earlier on, you feel like you're killing your horse. You feel like you're you know you're responsible for for taking the the life away, and, and that is a really hard thing to do, you know, to actually make that decision. And sometimes, you know, the, the timing of that is very difficult as well. You know, are, are, you, are you doing it at the right time? Is it too early? Is it too late? Could it have lived another couple of weeks? Something like that. So I think it is, it is really difficult to judge. And, and, and I can't say really what is the right time. I'm not saying that there's a, you know, there's a right or a wrong time to do it. And, and that very much comes down to the individual. Obviously, we'll try and make as much um, or, or contribute as much to the discussion as we can, but it's still, ultimately, you are the person that's with that, that horse for the, the, the majority of the time, and it's you that's going to make that decision. So moving on to emergency, again, this, this is a sort of thing, um, this is the lost cause, shall we say, this is a horse that isn't going to get better. Um, just to sort of, just digress a bit, maybe any of uh, any of the uh, any of you that have been to one of our previous talks may recognise this horse. This was a horse that that had brain damage effectively, and um, when I got to this horse, the owner basically said they wanted it euthanizing uh, because it was flat out, it was fitting on the floor, it was it, it you know it it wasn't going to get better. You wouldn't have given it you know a, a, a penny for its life. Really, it really didn't look good, but. It, it, we came round, it, we managed to sort of sedate it and it eventually over a long period of time, a lot of effort from from the owners, um, it did actually come right and this, this horse has actually had two foals since. So um, so not, not everything's a lost cause but you know some of them are, some of them are the broken legs, the, the twisted gut colic, that type of thing which you know unfortunately we, um, we, we do see every now and then. So all right, no, no problem, come and sit down. Yeah, we're just going through, just for the people that arrived, we're just going through a, about the, the different sorts of, um, of times you make decisions. So you've got elective ones where you decide to make it, or you've got the emergency ones where you don't really get a choice. You know, these, these are the things that um, your horse is basically in, it's suffering really, and it, and it needs to be, um, it needs to be euthanized. And I, I know it, it might sound an odd thing to say, but Actually, this is a really nice thing that you can do for your animal. And I think in both situations, both elective and for these emergency um, situations, you know, it's one thing that we don't have a, in human, in, in human medicine. You cannot say enough's enough, you know. And I, I've, I've seen people that have been in that situation where it's nil by mouth basically to, to dehydrate them to death and it's not a nice thing to see. But at least with horses, we can, well, with animals, we can give them that, that dignity and, and that, sort of that time to, um, to go with a, with a bit of peace. Um, like I said before, emergency, there isn't a decision to make. Um, so you don't tend to get the guilt that you, you got with the elective one. So you don't really think, oh, I killed my horse because it, it was necessary. It had to be done at that time. There was no waiting about. There was no messing about. It had to be done. And as it says there, on humane ground. So it, it was for the, the horse's welfare that you did it. And like I say, a lot easier to, to sort of decide on that. Um, sometimes it, you may not get that, that sort of opportunity to say goodbye to your horse in, in these sort of situations. So um, this is Eddie. He's, you, some of you may well have known if you, if you follow us on Facebook. Is, is a horse that had colic surgery um, just over six months ago now. And basically, we, it was touch and go whether we, we euthanized him 
before he, well, we, we weren't going to send him for colic surgery, basically. Um, he was at home and Emily decided that he, he wasn't going to make it and that it was, it was a good idea to euthanise him. I thought we'd give him a chance and we did and thankfully we did, but seeing him in that state, he was in, he was a horrendous mess, you know, he really, I, 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 I know it's worse when it's your own animal and, you know, you, you get more distressed, but he really, he really was a mess. He was, it looked like he was neurological, which I know people say sometimes with colic. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't say I was very adamant that he was going to survive. And I actually, on, on the way to the, the hospital, we, um, I made sure I had a, a, a euthanasia kit in my car. It, it, sorry, in, in the uh, in the horse trailer, uh, horse box. Sorry, um, to be able to give him it if he wasn't going to make it or if he collapsed halfway to the journey. So, it's um, it can happen. But once he was there, I had to say to Emily, "Look, you, you've got to say bye to him. You've got to." You know, give him a pat, give him a kiss, whatever, and accept that he may not survive. And and sometimes that, that can be a, a difficult thing to do. And, and sometimes it's even worse when you've dropped them off, say, you don't wait about for the colic surgery and you go home and then you get that dreaded phone call where, oh, God, they've gone downhill and you can't get back to see them. So, you know, you've got to sort of be aware that sometimes in different situations you don't get that opportunity to say bye. So... Um, you know, again, a another thing which, you know, you often can with the other sorts of things. So, preparation. Um, <clears throat> well, if we can, you know, where we're going to do it, who we're going to do it. So, this is the actual moving on from, you know, the, I suppose, the dilemma of, of when you make that decision or if you make that decision. Uh, now, we're moving on to more like preparation about the actual act of doing it. And, and this is really important as well. There's a lot of factors we'll, we'll come on to talk about. But, you know, it, um, it is really important to prepare yourself um, if possible. And the reason I say if possible, um, like I say, it may be elective or it may be emergency. So you may not have the choice. Um, you may be on holiday, and, and the number of times this happens, honestly, you, you almost wouldn't believe it that people go on holiday, and while they're on holiday, the horse has a, a wound over its joint, or it's gone, you know, it's, it's broken its leg, or something like that. You can't get hold of the owner, and, and nobody's really made any preparations for it. And it sounds a very morbid thing to do, but, you know, it, it's sometimes necessary, even at work. And, and I know, you know, I'm not saying you go to work dreading every morning what's going to happen, but we've had people you just can't get hold of them at work, and again, there's a, a decision to make sometimes. So um, it is hard, and, and like I say, it sounds a bit, a bit morbid, but make arrangements, you know, decide what you're going to do, e even tell somebody on the yard, if, you, if you're on a delivery yard where, you know, the, the owner knows... Um, what you want to do, you know, make make sure that that's that's done. So that that's the if you can. Then there's the where, you know, where you're going to do it. Are you going to do it in the stable? It may be that 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 is the only place, or is it? Have you got something like a, a field where, you know, you can do it where it's a you know a soft landing? And and I I'll come on to talk about the the actual act in a bit. But and and it probably doesn't matter. But I feel it does, you know, when I'm doing it, that they land on a soft surface. Um, as we'll come on to talk about, like I said, the, the horse is actually unconscious when they go onto the floor. But there's still something about that thing. And, and, it, and it, I, I may be being silly, I don't know. But to me, you want something like a softer surface. You want, a, you know, the bedding in the stable, you want an arena, or you want the grass. You know, something like that. And the other awkward thing then is getting them out of there which you know we'll come on to talk about as well so if it's in a stable um, it's okay doing it in the stable but then if they're in the opposite corner then it's very difficult to to get them out of that so I think again you know th there's a lot of things to think about sometimes you don't have that opportunity to you know to decide that it, you know it, it literally is just well, you do it here because the horse can't walk out. You know, it's in the field because, um, you know, the, the horse is uh, that lame that it can't be moved. So, you know, really, really important. Just, um, just try and have a think about it. Like I say, it may be if it's a broken leg, if it's laminitis, you, you, it's not fair to walk it across, you know, 200 metres down the, the field so that you, you can do it in the field. Um, or if, if it is an old horse that's in that's gone down in the field again you can't move it it's you know you you, you want to move it when it's dead rather than moving it um, when it's alive so um, 
Um, where again, it, I suppose it depends on the timing of the euthanasia. So, you know, what, are you going to do it in a stable on the yard? Um, but then again, if it's a busy livery yard, the, that's the last thing you want with people walking past. And you know, um, if it's if it's a, a riding school, people walking past. So, you know, th there are things when you, you know you can do it at sort of school times, um, or even sometimes um, when can everyone be there? You know, that that will often dictate um, when you do it as well um, and and that again is an important thing everyone wants to say bye to the the horse so you know try and try and arrange it and, and then arrange where you can do it so where um, you know th this is our, actually our yard and, and I've thought long and hard in fact coincidentally that is Eddie's stable that he was in when he started colicking and you can imagine if we were to euthanize him in there it, it's a hell of a job getting him out of there because basically it's either the top where you can see the the light at the end of the yard or it's it's an equivalent distance the other way so how how the hell would we have got him out but um but you know that that's that that's secondary to the horse's welfare that's got to be primary and and I always think you know at the end of the day, I'd rather move a dead horse than move one that was alive if, if it's in that much distress. Uh, and then who? You know, an, another, another thing about the preparation, who do you want to be there? It may be that, that you don't want to be there, um, and that's understandable. It may be you, you might want your friend, you might want your husband, you might want, you know, somebody, one of your closest friends. You may just want the yard staff, someone who's looked after the horse. Um, you may just want us to do it on our own and just go away around the corner and not watch it. And again, that's perfectly understandable. I, 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 can, I can really empathise with people that don't want to be there. Um, because, it, you know, it, it isn't a pleasant thing necessarily to see your horse. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk about the, the actual procedure now. Um, there aren't any nasty photos, so don't worry. I'm not going to show, um, show what, uh, what exactly goes on. Um, but... I suppose this, this might have been in the, in the bit before about sort of elective and um, probably more elective euthanasias, but the, the actual procedure, it's often a good idea to have a lot of discussions with people whose opinions you respect, and that may be family, it may be friends, um, it may be people obviously like ourselves, um, or even the farrier, you know, often the farrier's a, a good friend of yours because um, you see them every six weeks, they know the horse inside out, they may be done them for the last 30 years. Um, or even a physio, you, again, you may have a, a good friend who's a physio or a back person or it might be the dentist or whoever, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but, but, you know, be prepared to discuss it with them, don't, don't worry about doing that sort of thing. And then another thing which, um, which does un unfortunately rear its ugly head sometimes is insurance formalities, which it, it's almost, it, you almost feel a bit disrespectful talking about this sort of thing when you're having your horse being euthanized, but it often causes a lot of problems after the event. So if the insurance company um, are going to be funny about it, it causes a lot of distress for you as a horse owner afterwards. So get things that, like this sorted out earlier. There's this thing called the Beaver Guidelines, the British Equine Veterinary Association Guidelines, which basically say that an animal has got to be um, in constant and unrelenting pain that cannot be controlled by painkillers, which in, in a way, that, that's a, you know, my summary of it, but it basically is a horse with a broken leg or it's a horse that's got a twisted gut or something like that, or it's basically not going to survive. So it's not just your horse that's two out of ten laying because it's arthritic and things like that. Um, I don't actually agree with them. I think that it should be a bit more wide ranging than that, but that's what they stipulate and that's what the insurance companies um, have as their, their rules and regulations. And it's a good idea to read that actually because um, you know, that it depends on what the insurance company interpret as your horse as to whether it meets the beaver guidelines and whether they're going to pay out on it. And again, it's so distressing afterwards when people are trying to get money back and um, it, it really isn't nice. So again, try and sort it out beforehand. We'll do everything we can to help you in with that, you know, and, and we'll do our best to, you know, if, if we can get them to pay out. But at the end of the day, we can't lie. We can't say, yes, the horse couldn't wait there on its leg or whatever. Um, and you know, it, obviously, if it's a broken leg, if it's a surgical colic, that's not an issue. But if it, if it's one of the more sort of grey areas, it, it is more difficult to to guarantee that they're going to pay. So what do you do? What you know, you've decided to to euthanize your horse. What do you do? So the first thing is telephone the office. Um, obviously, if it's a, an elective one, 
um, we can arrange the time and the date, um, or the date and the time, and, and in, you know, and, and both of those, honestly, we, we will do our best. We bend over backwards to, to accommodate you with that, because we, we all regard it as an important thing, and we, we know that, you, you know, for you it might be you want it at such and such a time. Like I was just saying, it might be a quiet time on the yard, it might be when, you know, the, everyone's gone to school, or maybe there's no lessons arranged or whatever. So honestly, we will bend over backwards to help you and be there. And it's one of those things, I know we have this thing about vets are always late, but we, we do try and, you know, we, we pull, all, pull out all the stops to be there on time, I, I promise you that. Uh, obviously, if it's an emergency, well, you ring us and we'll get there as soon as we can. You know, we're lucky we've got five vets who can, you know, we can generally get somebody there, uh, you know, within half an hour. That's, that's the almost the maximum period of time in most cases. Obviously it depends on traffic but we, we would do our best. Um, what I will say about you know our office staff is they're all horse owners um, and you know these are the office members you know but the top right that's Becky then there's Emma and there's Gemma and then there's Emily on the far left of, um, of that group photo. Um, so what I'm trying to say is they understand where you're coming from. So, you know, they appreciate what you're going through. Um, you know, some of them have been through it themselves. So it, it's, not, it's not a nice thing to, to have to go through, but they'll try and talk you through it. And again, they'll pull out all, all the stops for you. So I'll get down to the nitty gritty now. Um, again, I'm not going to be showing, I'm not showing any nasty pictures, so you don't need to turn away. There's going to be no gore in this, um, in this talk, but basically you've got you've got two options. You've got either chemical injection, which is what we use, or you've got shooting. Um, it's all a matter of opinion. Um, I I prefer the injection. Um, I know some people prefer shooting them with a bullet. Um, I, I do have my gun license, but I, I don't shoot them. I, I must be honest, it's not something I, I would like. I, I know I appreciate there are people with different opinions. Being honest, I think to the horse, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. I think if you've got a, a very uh, needle shy horse, maybe the, the bullet is better. Um, if you've got a very head shy horse, certainly injection is better. But I think, you know, because they're both very quick. Um, procedures, I don't think it really matters to the horse. I think to everybody else, shooting is is awful. Well, you know, I, I have shot a couple of horses and I, I really don't like it. So, chemical injection, it's the quiet, it's the calmest, it's the only way we do it. Basically, they fall asleep. I know that it's a bit more difficult with a horse because they're a big animal, they're, you know, half a ton and more sometimes, um, and they stood up, so they've got to you know, go down to the ground. We appreciate that. It's a lot easier with dogs and cats that you can curl in a basket or you can cuddle. Um, you can't really do that with a horse. And, and so that, that is the only sort of downside about it. But basically they fall asleep. And if, um, if any of you have um, ever seen a, a general anaesthetic, uh, the induction of general anaesthesia, which is basically what we do, we, we give them a sedation, uh, a pre-med, um, and then we put a, a catheter in, and then we give them the, the anaesthetic drug. And that, that's basically what we do for, for euthanasia. Um, it's just that the, um, the anaesthetic that we give is a, an overdose, effectively. Um, the actual anaesthetic, the, the pre-medication, the sedative, is, is really what we would normally use. It's, it's exactly the same as any, uh, uh, sorry, any sedative that we, we would normally use. Um, the anaesthetic is a slightly different one. It's a barbiturate based thing and it's got an extra drug in it which stops the heart. So basically they're anaesthetized first, they fall asleep first and then after about, well, anything from a minute to two minutes the heart stops and, and that's really how it works. So. The only difference, obviously, it, you know, it is the same as a general anaesthetic apart from the, the extra drug that's added to it. So, yeah, that's, that's what I've, I've just said, really. That the, it, and the drugs that anaesthetise work first, and then there's another one that stops the heart. And they just go sleepy, um, and then they, do, they just generally just drop to the ground, or we help them to the ground, we hold on to the head collar and just allow them to go down. Uh, most of them will go down onto the knees and then just gently roll over onto the side. So that's the ideal one. 
okay, you'll, you'll have heard some horror stories, I'm sure, where, you know, horses that don't die and things like that. Um, yeah, I've heard of those. I, I can honestly say, touch wood, I have never had that happen to me. Um, I've been qualified for 24 years now. I've euthanized a lot of horses this way and I've never had it happen to me. I may just be lucky, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I can honestly say, the, you know, if you do it properly, it will go according to plan. Um, I hope I don't end up eating my words, but anyway, um, that, that is the way. Shooting, um, well, yeah, it's done with a free bullet. It's not as pleasant an experience. I, I know I'm not saying it's a pleasant experience, but it's, it, has anyone ever seen them being shot? Yeah, okay, there's maybe a couple. Um, it, one, of the, one of the main things that I don't like about it um, is it, it's a very violent sort of procedure. It, it's, you know, it's, it's like a big bang, and then they drop to the ground. Often there's a huge amount of blood coming down the nose, and they'll often gallop. Around, you know, they almost like have these, these sort of muscle contractions, and, and it's really unpleasant to see. Um, I can honestly say I've never seen that with chemical injection, with, with you know, drug euthanasia. Um, some of them will stretch out a little bit, as they, uh, you know, tremble a little bit as they're going down, but not the flat-out gallop that I've seen with, with shooting. And I, yeah, okay, like I say, it's, it's individual preference, and the main thing is to the horse, it doesn't make any difference, but it's not as nice to see. Um, I suppose one of the things about shooting, which probably doesn't apply to us. I, I, don't, I honestly don't know any clients that do have horses for human consumption, but obviously if we inject them, they can't go for any animal consumption. So um, shooting is the only thing that you can actually put them into the food chain after that. Um, I've, I've already mentioned this. Um, like I said, I don't believe the scare stories. I, I think th there's always good and bad. You know, I've heard of horses being shot twice, three times because they missed first time. Now, that, that just doesn't happen. I, I, you know, the people that I know that do shoot them are very good at it. Very, they do it on a regular basis and they're very good at it. So I, I, don't, I don't, you know, the scare stories either way of the injection or, or the, the shooting. Like I said about head shy, needle shy. Like I said, personally, I, w I would always inject them. That, that's just my feeling on it. I think it's a, a far quieter karma. I, I, you know, like I said before, it's almost like the final act of dignity you can give your horse. And sometimes it is a nice thing to do. I know that sounds a funny thing to say, but it is a nice thing to do. You can just let them fall asleep. Um, if they're down, it makes it even easier. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a pleasant experience, but hopefully we can try and make it as, as manageable as possible. And, um, and hopefully for the right reasons that, you know, you've, you've, you're saying goodbye to a, a friend and, and that's it really. Um, something that, you know, after you've done the event, um, which is, is, I think it's becoming quite a, a popular thing now, but there are even, even where people, you know, take pieces of mane and tail and things like that. They can make them into jewellery now, I think in a necklace or bracelets and things like that. Um, obviously people will want the shoes back, that's quite a common thing. And, and some people want their ashes back and, again, uh, you know, I, I've still got, um, some dog, some of my dog's ashes that I euthanized about 16 years ago, and I, I keep, well, I, they were under the bed, but I think Emily's probably moved them now. Um, but um, I'd had them for 16 years, and I, I didn't know what to do with them. Um, and, and so I, I understand people who don't want their ashes back. I understand people who do, and you know, want to scatter them on the field. That's that's great. But sometimes you just, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm a bit pathetic, but you just don't want to let. What you've thrown them away. You better not have thrown them away now. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, sometimes you just don't know what to do, and, and it, it's part of that letting go. And you know, I'm possibly the worst person to talk about that, really. But things like plaques on um, on a bench or a wall or a tree or something that that's quite a nice thing. Um, and you can even bury the ashes underneath. That that's often a thing. And then you know, coming on to the bereavement thing, you know, however you feel. That's, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with what you feel. And I, I always get it where people, people are crying when they, they're having the horse euthanized and they're apologizing to me. And, and I, you know, they don't need to apologize, that's the first thing. But, I, and, and this does make me sound a bit odd, but I actually quite like the fact that they're upset because I think that shows that they had a real bond with their animal. And, um, and I actually worry more about the, the situations where the owners are very cool and calm and 
just walk away and they're not upset. I, it almost thinks, you know, makes you think, well, I know what I'd be like in that situation. And it means, you know, if they are upset, they've got a real bond with them. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with how you feel. There's nothing, you know, we're not automatically going to just go like that and, and go back to normal. Um, you have lost a friend, you've lost a family member. And uh, the amount of time, there, there was some survey done, I think I've, I've spoken about this in the past, about the time spent doing a certain activity every week. And I think um, as regards sort of people times the number of hours that they do it every, every year, I think horse owning or horse riding was the highest in the country because, the, okay, it's, there's not as many people that play, uh, that, sorry, that, that ride horses as say play football, but you spend a lot more time doing it. It's often at least an hour a day. You may, you know, weekends you might spend four or five hours there. So the actual number of hours, yeah, if, if you're Gemma, uh, you spend four or five hours every night with your horses. Um, you don't go home till 10 o'clock. But, you know, so the, the amount of, of sort of people hours that are spent is more than any other activity in, in Britain, I believe. I, I, it might be one of those urban myths, but maybe Mike's going to talk about that in a few minutes. I don't know. But, um, but you know, you've spent a lot of time. They are part of the family. They are the people that you talk to. You, you know, you you've just broken up with your boyfriend or you've just had a, a bad time at work, you go and chat to your horse, don't you? Well, I do. Not that I've got a boyfriend, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that. But, um, um, but yeah, you, you're allowed to do that. And um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, sorry, what I, was, I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to make it a bit easier. But um, yeah. The stages of grief, these, these are a natural thing. This is what you go through. Uh, this, this is, uh, you know, regarded as a, a human psychology thing. Um, and we, we all go through this and, you know, denial, it's not going to happen. You don't want it to be done. It's, you know, there's nothing wrong with my horse, you know, all this sort of thing. Or, or even, you know, I can't believe it's happened, you know. Why me? I, you know, anger, why me? Why is it that horse? Why is it an eight-year-old horse? that you know, potentially has a surgical colic and, and could die, rather than the 28-year-old that's in the field that's had a good long life. You know? why, is, why does it happen to me? My horse, you know, I know there are some people in here that have just, you know, the horses are always getting things wrong with them. It's not because they don't look after them. They probably look after them too well. Um, but you know, why is it always me? Why does it happen to me every single time? And then you know, this bargaining thing. Oh, what, what if I'd just done that? If I hadn't have, if I hadn't put him out in the field, he wouldn't have got colic. If, you know, if I hadn't put him with that new horse, he wouldn't have been kicked. You know, you can always what if and why did I do that? And if I'd only done something different. And then there's the depression. You know, unhappiness. Clearly, you know, you and and again, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you work your way through this. You're allowed to be unhappy. It's you know, you've you've lost a friend. Um, and then hopefully you get through to the last bit, the acceptance. Um, and they're coming to terms with it. And, you know, you will get through that. In some people it takes maybe years, maybe some people it takes a matter of days or weeks. Again, depending on the situation, if it's elective, you might have already, you might have gone through a few of these stages already and, you know, you've just got, you're almost in the depression phase when it's done. The other stages, when it's an emergency thing, you might be, you know, right at the start. Um, so, like I said, there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with any of those. And, and talking about it does help. And whether that's talking about it to us, talking about it to friends, family, whoever, you know, do it, talk about it. Communication is really the key to this and getting things off your chest. And it's amazing how much better you feel when you've, you've actually, you know, said certain things or, or talked about certain things. Um, and you may have had the opportunity to prepare yourself, so that's great. That's a bit easier. Um, but most importantly, don't feel on your own. You know, you're not the only person to have gone through this, and other people will understand it. You know, they, they know what you're going through. So, you know, don't feel like it's, uh, um, it, it's necessarily you against the world sort of thing. Um, the other thing that um, I had the other day, I don't know if she's here, but there was, um, there was a client who actually euthanized the, the horse in front of the, the child, which is the first time I've ever seen that, that happen, actually. But actually, I, I think it was a really good thing. And I, I think, you know, again, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I don't know whether that's a, a good or a bad thing. But certainly with her and her, her child, it, it did seem to help. She was only about 
it was five or six years old, this, this child, and it really did seem to, you know, she had a good cry, she understood her mum was upset, but, you know, it, it's almost a good thing to talk to children, explain what, what's going on, and, and maybe prepare them. I'm not saying necessarily have them there, but, you know, maybe have them just around the corner. Um, and then, you know, we're always here to help. You know, we will try and help you as much as we can. We'll, you know, quite literally hold your hand through it if you want us to. Um, ring us to talk, you know. We, we do understand it. We, we do understand what you're going through. We've, we've been through it a lot. Um, we've been through it ourselves. Um, but we also, you know, we understand what you're going through. And, you know, there, everyone's allowed to cry. There's, there's no problem with, you know, our, our, our girls in the office, they've had people crying down the phone because they've had to make that decision and you know again there's nothing wrong with that people get really worried about you know crying in front of people there's nothing wrong with it it really is i think it's actually quite a good thing